good to be here. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, reading in verse 8, and there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So as often as he turned in, he would eat. And she said to her husband, look now, I perceive this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small room on the wall and put for him a bed, a chair, a table, and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes, he can turn in there. And it happened one day. What if today was the day? What if today was the day for what you've been believing for happened? What if God showed up and spoke one word that turned your situation around? And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room. And he lay down there and said to Gehazi, a servant, call the Shumanite woman. And when he called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, saying out of her, look, you have been concerned with us for all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what can be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he called for her, and when he called for her, she stood in the doorway. She stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. I want to talk to you this morning from the subject, standing in the doorway standing in the doorway verse 15 and when he called for her she stood in the doorway three things that I believe God is doing right now in the greater church not just the local body but the greater church I believe we're in a season of kingdom alignment because alignment always precedes assignment Anytime you walk in a greater season of assignment, there is always a requirement of a greater season of alignment. God will always align you when he assigns you. When God is bringing you into a moment, a place, a time, he's equipping you. He will always align you. He'll align you with his word. He will align you with purpose for that moment you've been called to. Not only is it a time of season of kingdom alignment, it's a time of kingdom connection where God is bringing connections to the body, not just in the church, but even outside the church, where he's intertwining those things needed for your purpose. For you may not realize it, but you're here on purpose for purpose. There's a reason you're here in Athens, Florida. Your reason you're here in this season, uh, Athens, Georgia. I just can't get away from that, you know. Athens, Georgia. Look at your neighbor and say, we are in Georgia today. Season of kingdom connection, but last, a season of advancement. Where God is advancing us, he is moving us from glory to glory, from season to season. The problem is when we fail to align, we usually get stuck in the movement when we're moving from glory to glory. And if you do not watch, you can get stuck in those two little letters, the T and the O. Those hallways of our seasons. I love the seasons of God. I love where God is displaying his glory in my life. But usually the battle for me is in the T and the O. It's in the hallway way of transition because I'm not where I used to be but I'm not yet where I'm going I'm not in the place where God manifests himself in the past but I'm not yet in my tomorrow that he's already spoken over but I've got good news he's a timeless and a spaceless God you say well pastor what does that mean it means he can stand in your crazy today speak over your messed up past and be standing in your prophetic future all at the same time I'm going to say that one more time he can interrupt your crazy now. He can step back into your crazy yesterday that is fragmented and broken that you can do nothing with, but also be in your tomorrow that is yet to come. And when you realize you serve a God like that, you say, align me for the next season. Prepare me for the next season. Work in. Anybody believe you've got an appointment with destiny in the next season? Put your hands together and give him honor and praise. Doorways are powerful places. I noticed when I got to Athens, Georgia, there were doors in my hotel. We locked the door at night because I'm not sure about some of these bulldogs. 
Because doorways can not only take me in, they become security and protection. Doorways are powerful places. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 7 that Noah walked through a door. And the Bible said that God shut the door behind him. This door was so significant. God gives us the month and the day and the year of Noah's life. Said it was the 600th day, the second month, and the 27th day. That God brought him through a door so significant that God marked the very day of his life. It wasn't just any door. It was a door connected to a boat that he built for a generation. He built this boat when there was no water to float the boat. He built this boat when people laughed at the boat. He built this boat when no one saw any purpose in the boat. And for a generation he worked on this boat. And one day God brings him through the door of this boat. And the Bible said God closes the door behind behind him and the Bible said at that moment fountains of the deep begin to break open and the heavens begin to give way with rain and God begin to float Noah's boat. Sometimes it's one doorway that takes your boat into a new season. Sometimes it's one moment that carries you into the goodness of what God has for you. The Bible tells us in the book of Samuel there was a young boy that walked through a door and on the other side of the door the Bible said there was a long haired prophet that refused to sit down until David arrived and the Bible said that prophet took a horn of oil and released it over David. And the Bible said he walked in a shepherd, but he left a king. One door can change everything. One moment in God's presence can shift where you're at. Doorways are powerful places. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life in abundance. But in John chapter 10, verse 9, he said, I am the door. If you're going to get to the abundance, you've got to come through me. Because no man gets to the Father unless he walks through the door. Jesus tells us about the door. In Revelation, he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you will let me in, we will have fellowship together. And any time you come into fellowship with the Father, everything begins to change. Any time you allow his presence to invade your life and you open the door to his goodness, everything changes. Where we're at in our text, we find that these people have just lived through a recession. Times are lean, times are tight. Things are not in a season of overflow. But one day we find that the man of God that carried the anointing of God for that hour, he passed by. And the minute that he passed by and that anointing touched that house, something shifted. And the Bible said something began to happen. The Bible said the woman of God looked at this man and said, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. Perception is the eye of the Spirit. It's where you see what is not yet arrived, but you just believe God is doing something. It's where you see things that are greater in your future, even though you're living in a season of lack. It's where you see something greater than the now, even though you know God is working on you and in you. The Bible said she looked at her husband and said, I perceive this is a holy man of God. There's some of you in this room, you're walking in a season of perception. You say, I don't know exactly what God is doing, but I know he's doing something. I can't tell you exactly how he's arranging things or what it's going to look like. But I just sense in my spirit that God is working. Perception is the eye of the spirit. It's that place where you begin to believe for greater even though you've not yet walked in it. But not only was there a season of perception in her life, she understood to get to where God was taking her, she needed to partner with her husband. Because there is always power in partnership. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom. God has called us to do ministry together. That's why ministry is always better with friends. It's always better in relationship. That's why Jesus found 12 and they turned the world upside down together. The Bible said she looked at her husband and said, let's partner. Let's come together and do something significant. Let's partner in what we believe God is doing. I know I perceive that, but we can't do it by ourselves. I cannot do it alone. Let's partner. The Bible said if one can put a thousand to fly and two can put 10,000 to fly, there is something that happens when you come and you partner with other 
other believers. When you join a church like this and you tell Pastor Scott and Elizabeth, we're with you. We're going to lift your arms. We're going to walk beside you and see God do a mighty work in Athens, Georgia. Together we are always stronger. She looked at her husband and said, I can't do this alone. What I'm believing for is bigger than me. It's bigger than what I can do in myself. Not only do we partner with one another, but there is a vertical partnership where you reach up and say, I know without you I can do nothing. Without you I will surely fail. But I know that I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. Are you glad that Jesus is on your side today? Are you glad that you're partnered with the heavens this morning? But she did not even stop at partnership. They moved to a place that trips most of us up. It's called investment. Because nothing ever happens in your kingdom journey that it does not cost you. The only thing free in your journey is salvation and grace. Everything else is requirement. Uh, there is something required of you. The Bible said she looked at her husband and said, let's build. Let's add an upper room. Let's make an addition to this house. Well, you have to understand, they've just come out of a famine. They've just come out of a recession. They are walking in a lean season. Things are not overflowing. They're not giving out of their excess. It's tight right now. And she looked at her husband and said, let's come together and build a room. But not just any room. Let's build an upper room, a room that's at another level. And when we build it, let's furnish it. Let's put a bed there and a table and a lampstand and a plasma TV on the wall so we can watch the bulldogs play football and basketball. Let's furnish it right. Let's do it well. Let's invest in it. And the Bible said as the man of God came by, he found something he liked because the Bible said he began to return regularly. Once you find out what attracts the presence of God, just keep doing it. Once you learn that generosity attracts the presence of God, become more generous. Once you realize that your worship attracts the presence of God, just keep worshiping. Once you understand that service attracts the presence of God, just keep serving. And the Bible said they built this room. And the Bible said that the man of God showed up. And he began to dwell there. And the atmosphere of the house began to change. And the Bible said that the longer he stayed, the more things began to shift. And he asked the servant one day, ask the lady and her husband if they would desire to move to a better place in town. I've got connections. They're building this new gated community across town. And, you know, I've got connections and, you know, I can get in on the ground floor. I know the builder. I can help them move to a better place. Servant goes and asks the lady and she makes a statement. No, I dwell among my own people. What she was saying, I know the grass may look greener on the other side of the fence, but we are believing for a breakthrough right here. I know that might be the easy route, but we have prayed, we have fasted, and we are trusting God that God is going to show up right here. I know that it may be the easy route, but we're believing that God has marked this place with his presence, and eventually God is going to turn things around. God is going to show up and break out. We dwell among our own people. And the Bible said the man of God, Ask the servant, what can we do for her? And the servant, trying to be very careful, he said, there are no children in this house, and her husband is really old. He didn't want to talk about the lady's age. He said, her husband, have you seen her husband? They are well past the, the years of being productive. I'm not going to get too in-depth right here. They can't have children. What he was saying was this, this is good. But this is all it will ever be. This house is nice, but there is no future. There is no life in this house. This is all this house will ever be. As good as it is right now, this is all it will ever be. And the man of God, the Bible said, Elisha calls her. And the Bible said when he called her, she stepped into a doorway. A doorway that did not exist in the last season. A doorway that when she stepped into the threshold, everything was about to change. And this is what he declared to her. Get ready this time 
next year you are going to have a son. And she stepped back and said, man of God, please do not lie to me. Do you understand this is the promise and the thing that I've waited on? This is the thing that I cry myself to sleep over? This is the thing that every time I look in the mirror, I realize it's past. I realize every time I see my husband, this promise has now been is fleeting and it's not in our possession or we will never have it. Every time I go to the market, I hear the snickering of other women. I know that this is impossible, but this is what the Bible says. At the appointed time, just as the man of God declared, she had a son. Someone this morning, you are standing in a doorway. Oh, you perceived in the last season that God was going to do something. You partnered with those around you. You've invested in the kingdom. And some of you are standing in a doorway. And God is saying, get ready. Your promise is about to come. The impossible is about to come. That thing that you've been believing for is about to be released because you have an appointment with destiny. You are standing right at the brink of what God wants to do. A few years ago, I was in Nicaragua, and I was ministering and a meeting there. And in our journeys, we were traveling from one city to the next. And we stopped in a little community, a very poor area. And it was me and the, the gentleman that put the meeting together and our interpreter. And our interpreter's name was Ronald Reagan Garcia. You know it's going to be a good meeting when the Gipper is doing your translating. And uh, he said his parents just loved Ronald Reagan and they named him after Ronald Reagan. So he, he, was, he was my partner for the week. And we stopped in this little village and when I got out of the car, I had never met the pastor. We were just stopping to just greet the pastor. Those with me knew him. It was not part of my assignment. But when I walked up to this little church, I felt the Holy Spirit say, tell this pastor you will build him a church. The problem is, I was in Tampa struggling to build a church. We had no money. We had come to an old church that had much more history than destiny. We lived in 20 years gone by when things were good and overflowing. We had several hundred people in this time, but no money. And I got out of the car and I was walking up a hill and if I ever heard the Holy Spirit speak, I heard him tell me that day, tell him you will build him a church. I met the pastor, he greeted us, and we talked for a few moments, and I asked him, have you ever thought about building a church? I thought it may have been one of those testing moments where God was just seeing if I was willing. He ran in this little house, he came back out, and on the hood of our car, he laid out these sketches. I said, how much would this cost? He said, about $25,000. At that time, that was like 250000 I said, we're going to build this church for you. He went and got his wife and his children. He told them in Spanish what I had told him through the translator. They began to jump up and down and cry. I began to cry. They were crying because they were going to get a new church. I was crying because I had no money. We were all crying. I got in the car. And the minute we rolled out of there, after telling him I would start sending him some funds in the next few weeks, no board with me, no mission pastor, no one there to say, Pastor, we'll stand with you. I got in the car and I heard the enemy begin to talk to my mind. And I began to hear him tell me how foolish I was for telling that man in Nicaragua that I would build him a church when I could hardly pay my bills in Tampa, Florida. The whole ride to Esteli, our next place of assignment, I just heard the enemy over and over saying, how are you going to do this? But when I got to Esteli, my cell phone began to work. And I realized I had multiple calls that were missed. I called a number back and uh, that I did not recognize. And when I called the number back, I realized it was a professional football player that we knew. His name was Derrick Brooks, number 55, played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, just went to the Hall of Fame. I called him back and I said, Derrick, what can I do for you? He said, I, I want to talk to you about your building, Pastor. I said, okay, I'll be home on Monday. I, I arrived home on Monday and when he showed up, he showed up with 14 people. One of those gentlemen with him was named Ed DeBartlow that owns the San Francisco 49ers. He said, Pastor, we want to start a charter school in Tampa, Florida. And he said, your building is the only property that will work for us. I said, our 40-year-old church building? 
You want to buy this building in the heart of the recession where no one was buying churches or standing in line to buy old church buildings? You want to buy this building? He said, we have researched and your building is the only one that will work for us. And I don't know why, but I looked at them and said, for us to sell this building, it would take $8 million. The problem was my building was only worth $3 million. We're in the heart of the recession. Nobody's paying more for property than it's worth. I looked at them and said, for me to sell this building, us to move, we'd need $8 million. They called me a few days later and they said, Pastor, we talked amongst ourselves and uh, we will take the building. I said, what are you talking about? Mr. DeBartlow will write you a check for $8 million. I said, can he bring cash? No, I didn't. I... Small unmarked bills? No, I didn't really. I'm just... He said, he'll write you a check. I thought, where will we go? You know, now, I, well, that's great. You know, I've got this big check that they're willing to give me. I said, can you give me a few days to talk to my board? Can you let me talk to my wife? Can we pray about it? They didn't understand all this. I said, you know, I just need a little bit of time. I need to work through some things. I'm driving through the city on the same day, and I see them taking down a sign for a big box building right next to our football stadium. And I thought, that's got to be our building. I tracked down a gentleman. I called him, and I said, I pastor this church and we've sold our building and I need to buy your building. He started laughing at me. He said, Pastor, thank you for calling, but this is the third busiest corner in the city. You're right next to the football stadium. Everybody wants this property. We already have 23 bids. This is the largest piece on Del Mabry that's sold in over a decade. He said, we have Walmart and Publix and LA Fitness. And he went down the list of people that wanted the property. I was dejected. But I got up the next morning, and I thought, I'm going to call back. I called back. A lady answered the phone. I asked for the gentleman. She said, I'll be back in just a moment. Another gentleman answered the phone. He said, I'm sorry, but the gentleman you talked to yesterday, he is out sick today. God had already put something on him for laughing. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. It wasn't like a sickness unto death. It was like a head cold or something, you know. He said, but I'm his boss. My name is Josh Dormany. What can I do for you? I began to tell him my story, but I don't know why. He's in here in Atlanta, and I'm, I'm in Florida, and I start telling him, just like I'm telling you, all the way back from Nicaragua. I said, I was in the mountains of Nicaragua. I tell the whole story, and I say, now I need to buy your building. The phone was dead silent. I thought, this man probably thinks I'm crazy. He, then he said this. He said, Pastor, I'm the vice president of this company. I will help make the final decision. We'll fly to California in two weeks and I'll present everyone's bids and their proposals and we'll make a decision. But he said, I'm also on the mission board at First Baptist Church of Woodstock. Two days, uh, Two days had passed, heard nothing, a week passed, nothing. Finally, about 10 days later, he called me. He said, Pastor, we went, to, we went to California. He said, we laid out all the proposals. We got done. And he said, I began to tell them then about your church. I didn't have a proposal. I didn't have a bid. I just began to tell them your story. He said, you know, when I got to the part about Ed DeBartlow, the owner of our company said, I know Ed DeBartlow. I guess billionaires, they just roll in packs, you know. They just hang together, you know. He said, I know Ed. And at the end of the day, he said, you you know what? We sell to Walmart all the time. We sell to Publix all the time. He said, let the church have it if they can buy it. Let me tell you what happened. They gave me the keys. We've signed no papers yet. And I'm walking through this big box building. It's about 80,000 square feet. It looks like an airplane hangar. They give me the keys. And the minute I walk in, I thought, what am I doing? No, nobody's going to leave our traditional church building and come to this old grocery store. Nobody's going to leave. I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. We're getting ready to flip all these millions of dollars in real estate. And me and my wife and a few of my board members are walking through the building. And I begin to pray. And I said, Lord, I need to know your will. I need to hear hear your voice. And God being my witness, I walk in the office of an old grocery store. We're not in an old church. We're not in an old temple. We're in an old grocery store. And I walk in the office and hanging on the wall, there's a sign. It looks like it's been there for 15 years. And this is what it said. The will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot protect you. We bought that building 
20 weeks later we were worshiping and in the first six months a thousand new people came to that church in the last five years we have taken in four thousand new members we have bought another campus on the interstate I said all that to say this in Nicaragua I perceived God was doing something I didn't know how he was going to do it but I was willing to partner with someone that had no ability to bless me back and the Bible said that he called for her and she stepped into a doorway I believe we opened a doorway in Nicaragua and we stepped into a season that we could not make happen by ourselves and there are some of you in the last season it felt like all hell was breaking loose but God says you've been building a doorway everything that could go wrong did go wrong but God said oh no you've been building a doorway some of you are in this place where God says if you're willing to invest in somebody else's dream I'll invest in your dream see some of you the key to your answer in your house is not you just stacking up more money in your house it may be investing in this house and coming and saying pastor Scott what are we doing in the kingdom where can I be a blessing because what you make happen for others God will make happen for you I've come to Athens today to tell someone you are standing in the doorway he said get ready this time next year if we could just see ourselves where God is taking us this time next year you are going to have a son at the appointed time not just another mark on the wall not just another day in the week but she had an appointment with destiny the Bible said in Acts chapter 16 Paul and Silas they are beaten they are locked up they are in a bad place for doing the right thing and the Bible said they made a choice surrounded by common thieves and criminals the Bible said after being beaten and their hands locked to their feet at midnight see I find midnight can be one of two things in my life it can be the darkest hour and usually in the Word of God it is signifying a dark dark place but I'm reminded that when I watch television on New Year's Eve and I watch a million people gather in New York City when midnight hits and a button is pushed and a ball drops it signifies that a new season has just begun Paul and Silas at midnight the Bible said they are locked down they've been beaten and the Bible said they made a choice they were not going to talk about their sorrows or how bad it was the Bible said they begin to pray and they begin to sing they begin to pray and they begin to worship they begin to pray and they begin to declare they begin to pray and they begin to look with hope at a future and the Bible said the heavens begin to open and the jail begin to shake shackles begin to fall off and then the Bible Bible said the doors begin to open but it wasn't about getting out it was about who God was bringing in because the Bible said that the warden ran in he pulled his sword out not to kill prisoners but to take his very life because he knew what would happen if he lost prisoners on his watch and Paul said hey, hey put your sword up don't hurt yourself we're just having church come on in and the Bible said the warden that night looked at Paul and said what must I do to be saved he said just believe and the Bible said in in the same hour of the same night he was not only saved him and his family but they were baptized but the story doesn't even stop there the Bible said Paul moved from the jail to the warden's house the warden began to fix him food the Bible said and then the Bible says this the warden began to tend the stripes on his back the Bible said the, war the warden began to mend the wounds that were on his back this is what happened he was the same one that had put them there in the last season and this is what happened when God takes you through a door what tried to destroy you in the last season begins to lift you in the next season what tried to take you out in the last season it becomes a testimony in the next season oh you thought you were going to destroy me but you made me stronger you thought you were going to be my ceiling oh you've just become my platform you thought you were going to take me up it's a new day and a new season and because I made it through it I know the God I serve I know he is well able I know he is mighty in power I know he is the authority to bring me through. come on put your hands together if you know a God like that jump to your feet I believe there are some that are standing in a doorway and God is saying get ready oh you thought it was over I was just setting things in order 
there's a new season. You know, we, we frequent this mall in Tampa, Florida. Matter of fact, my house has a calling to the mall. We got three girls in our house. A special anointing for the mall. And we always park in one area of the mall because it's very strategically located between stores and a Starbucks. Because you need fuel to shop. You know, we go in this one area of the mall and Pastor Scott, it's got this beautiful entryway, all glass. And these beautiful doors that allow you to come into the mall and spend all the money you want. But you know, I find that those doors, they do not open when I pull in the parking lot. They do not even open when I find a place to park. They don't open when I get out of my car. But the closer I get to those doors, there's an automatic sensor. And the minute I get close enough to the doors, it's like magic. They just open. There's some of you, God says, you've been driving around the parking lot. You've even found a place to park. You've even got out of your vehicle and the doors have not yet opened, but as soon as you get in the vicinity of the Holy Spirit, as soon as you get close enough to that appointment you have with destiny, the doors are going to open. You're not going to have to pry them open. You're not going to have to kick them open. You're not going to have to pound on them. Till they, all you've got to do is keep moving by faith. And the minute you get to the threshold, the Bible says she stood in you know, there's really two facets to this story. The birthing of the promise and the reviving of the promise. Because if you keep reading, one day the boy is working with his father in the field and the Bible said the boy grabs his head and falls over dead because most of your battles you are defeated on start right here. Start right here. A thought, a stronghold, a place. The Bible said the boy died. Father, not knowing what to do, he picks up the child and carries the child to his mother. The mother surely being devastated because remember she told the man of God, don't even play with me. If you're talking about this promise, do not lie to me. This is my deep dream. In a moment, not knowing what to do, the Bible says she picks up the child. I love this. And, you're, and my Bible says she walk through the doorway lays the child on the bed looks at the servant and says get a donkey ready and get me to the presence of God and then she said do not slack on my account put the pedal to the metal get me quickly to the presence of God and the Bible said they got to the man of God and he asked her one question how is it with you how is it with your husband and how is it with your son Knowing, I'm sure, her husband was devastated. Knowing that her heart was breaking. Knowing that her son was lifeless on the bed. But remembering there was a doorway to another realm and another dimension. She made this declaration. You know, in the natural, it looks crazy. In the natural, it looks hopeless. In the natural, it looks like it's over. But we've got a doorway and we've invited the presence of God. So she made this declaration. It is well. It is well with my soul. I don't know how God is going to do it, but it is well. I don't know how he's going to turn it around, but it is well. I don't know how he's going to break through, but it is well. I don't know how he's going to perform the miracle, but it is well. The Bible said quickly, the man of God headed to the house. He walked through the door, the Bible said. I love this. He closed the door behind him. And that which was dead in the room began to live again.